number of issues threatening our world today. These threats, if not addressed in terms of adaptation or mitigation, lead to a disaster. We hear about natural hazards, but is a disaster natural? What makes a disaster a disaster? What makes us so vulnerable to these disasters? Elon Kelman of the University College London joins us for a coffee break to talk about disasters, vulnerability, and why a disaster can actually be our choice. Hi everyone and welcome back to Coffee Break with Urbana. I'm having my virtual coffee break with Elon Kelman, who's a professor at the University College London. He's a professor of disasters and health, right? So um, I'm having my virtual coffee break with um, Ilan, and we're going to talk about uh, his book, Disaster by Choice, and also about natural disasters and the COVID pandemic right now. So hi, Ilan, and uh, welcome to Coffee Break with Urbana. Well, thanks so much. Good to be here. Thank you for all the work that you're doing for us. Okay, so um, I just want to, I'm curious because uh, you're, you're working on disasters and um, you're also working on, you're teaching health and disasters, right? And what is your, what is your background? Well, in terms of my degrees, they're engineering. So I have three engineering degrees, but since then I've moved into a lot of fields. I certainly do a lot of social and political science now, mm -hmm. but never leaving the design background and always working with so many amazing people who just teach me so much. Being at University College London, I'm half at the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction, half at the Institute for Global Health, which means that I get to work with certainly other engineers, but also geographers, sociologists, doctors, mm -hmm. nurses, mm -hmm. other people in healthcare, anthropologists, economists, which is just so exciting. To a large extent, we drop our disciplines, deal with our skills, and really try to work together to tackle these issues of disasters and health. Are there any uh, clashes in, um, in thinking when you're talking to, because you're in, coming from the engineering background with a, with a soci sociology and political science point of view with the other um, engineers? Well, for me, the key in my classes is I want the mm -hmm. students thinking. Okay. And if yeah. it comes yeah. from a specific perspective, of course, that's relevant and that's fine and we need it. But we also have to think, you know, a bit critiquingly. What do those biases give? And it's not just disciplinary yeah. background or disciplinary bias, but it's really where we come from, who we are. And yeah, we run a lot of very exciting master's programs. Mm -hmm. So in global health, we have various masters in global health. And in my disasters institute, while well, mm -hmm. you sort of become a master of disaster, uh, hopefully <laughs> preferring to try and stop the disaster rather than create it. And I run a couple of modules. So I run climate change and health and also mm -hmm. conflict, humanitarianism and disaster risk reduction. Mm -hmm. And my view is that it's about discussion. It's about thinking. It's about interaction. You know, you want content, we have access mm -hmm. to the web. That's easy to find. But let's explore our own biases. Let's mm -hmm. explore our background and really see how we can think about the topic, mm -hmm. challenge the myths, and think creatively mm -hmm. and differently to move yeah. forward. Mm -hmm. What's really exciting is in my Disasters Institute, starting in September 2021, we are, have a Bachelor of Science in Global Humanitarian Studies. Mm -hmm. So starting students right out of secondary school, yeah to think about humanitarianism, to that think about cool. being human, to think about crisis, yeah. to think about all mm -hmm. these issues, and hopefully mm -hmm. really set them up for wonderful careers around mm -hmm. the world and just trying to help people. That's great. That's great to, to find out from you that, there, that you already have a, a bachelor's on global humanitarian studies. Uh, work and studies. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's it's good that you're already molding these young minds into becoming um, international development workers. But they're also molding yeah. us. I mean, our degrees yeah. are very much in response to what people need. And it's mm -hmm. so wonderful that people say, you know, I want my career to help people. And yeah, it's international development, but it's also local development. Yeah. Because if we're not able to apply these skills to ourselves, if we have mm -hmm. to go off to some other continent oh, yeah. to help these others, we're actually losing the point as opposed yeah. to saying this is yeah. for all of us and it helps all of us. 
to stop yeah. the disaster, to respond to appropriately, to help yeah. people deal with health, to help people deal with humanitarianism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at UCL, at University College London, that's what we're aiming for in our programs, which includes PhDs. So wow. we supervise a lot of PhD students on mm -hmm. a huge range of topics. Again, saying, what does development mean? What does international development mean? How can we do better and how can we apply it for ourselves in our own homes? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree with that because I, uh, with the work that I'm also doing right now, it's also emanated from, from an intrinsic point of view where uh, I thought that, you know, like I came up with this concept of a collective engagement in, in moving towards urban resilience. So I thought that, there are four dimensions in being collective. You know, you have your collective concern, collective action, collective efficacy, and collective security. So there are, you know, you start from, and that actually started because you, you think about when you, you're hit, let's say, by a flood, your only, your first concern is like, how will I survive this? Your concern for yourself. And then it comes, goes out. How can I help others? And then how can I be more effective in helping others? And how can we be secure? So that was how it grew in my in my head. Yeah, you're right. It has to come and you're from working this into your PhD, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you're 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 that's that's because I, I also worked um for a short period with uh, on the typhoon he and rebuilding. So I saw it. My, myself how how people responded how also we've worked with um other agencies the un uh unicef um doctors without borders uh and uh, so many other um i work with a uk DEC disaster emergency committee yep. uh yeah so i i do, work do you think on, we're um, learning do you think we're learning yeah. from that experience and doing better yeah. or yeah. I think um, I think it's more like we there. It's honestly, I think there's there's a there's a culture influence. I guess I think um, we on on building resilience. It's uh, and, and it's not just the culture. It's also uh, the gap, the disaster gap. So. If I will com compare here in the Netherlands, where they had the 1953 flood, right? It was all, the UK also was hit by that, the Great North Sea flood. So what the Dutch did was to really come up with a fantastic engineering Delta work system here, and and they never had that problem anymore. So the the problem now is that if they get hit, if let's say a breach happens, the 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 level of um damage is higher than than in countries where let's say in, in the Philippines where they have they don't have those dikes, they don't have those big infrastructures. But they're they always they often they often get flooded or they often see these disasters yearly or even even every six months <laughs> they have that typhoon um but they're so ready because they're they see it so i think i don't know if it's uh it's there's a um i'm still looking into that i think there's there's some culture involved and there's some as i said there's this disaster gap that there's, they've been looking into, that people become complacent because they have not felt a disaster for a long time. It's actually a real issue. And for a designer or a planner, it's often hard to know what to do because you're absolutely yeah. right that you build this yeah. big wall, you yeah. keep the water out, and people say, oh, there's a wall there, so we're safe. Yeah. And then they forget that they were flooded regularly. Yeah. And yeah. in the UK, the area which was worst hit in 1953 was Canby Island. Mm -hmm. which now is surrounded by a big wall mm -hmm. and the population has increased a lot. Mm -hmm. People don't necessarily know about warnings or evacuations, don't yeah, know what to do yeah. in a flood. And just yeah. like the Netherlands, if something goes wrong, yeah. uh, it's a real problem. And actually, ironically, you know, you very kindly mentioned sort of the book Disaster by Choice. Yeah, Disaster by Choice, yes. 
and yeah. Canby Island post 1953 is one of the case studies that I talk about, mm -hmm. as well as how the Thames Barrier, which mm -hmm. is downstream from London, to try mm -hmm. and stop North Sea surges mm -hmm. coming into uh, mm -hmm. London. So the Thames Barrier is also something I discuss mm -hmm. that after the Thames Barrier was built, the huge financial center of Canary Wharf was built. Mm -hmm. And it's right in the floodplain. So <laughs> on the one hand, we get a lot of people living and working, yeah. and you know that can be very good yeah. for jobs and for supporting mm -hmm. people. On the other hand, if there is a major storm surge and mm -hmm. it exceeds the Thames barrier, then a lot of infrastructure and a lot of people mm -hmm. get flooded, just like the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of that balance. So where yeah. are you? Are you in the Dutch floodplain? Are you near the wall? Or are you in the higher ground? <laughs> I'm, in, I'm actually in the innermost. <laughs> so actually, I'm more scared <laughs> because I'm in the innermost uh, ring, dike ring, because they have like several dike rings, right? So I'm in the innermost dike ring. So do you know uh, how to evacuate? I, I, well, they say it's vertical. <laughs> oh, okay. So just head up. <laughs> yeah. So you, it's, they say it's vertical. But then um, there, is, there is a place here, um, Dordrecht, uh, in Dordrecht, where they, where it's, really they're very vulnerable really there because it's an island so uh people have been telling them that yes we have to you know like educate the people that everyone should should vertically evacuate but there are some people who think that it's never going to happen <laughs> it's never going to happen so it's always a dilemma for for technical people um inviting them about this uh training on disaster management so it's 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 a it's a it's a dilemma right now because the level of uh, awareness risk awareness is very low but then again i also blame in a way the government because there's really no risk communication <laughs> on flooding so there are uh, there are warnings but mostly you know it's just warnings on um let's say uh fire or or traffic interruption but never never like a flood because there is no flood <laughs> that's according to them and there's also they also have this um adaptive uh climate adaptive uh, concept of a room for the river where they flood the flood plains because they realized when the when the hurricane katrina happened in the u.s that it can happen here. So they came up with this plan that, that we should have room for the river to overflow. And, and they were able to do that in some areas. But of course, uh, if you're going to talk about the general population on the level of risk awareness here, it's, it's very low. So isn't that your job to try and work with the government and get yeah. more measures in place and, and tell the population, you know, don't get scared because there's so much we can mm -hmm. do, but just be aware and yeah. be prepared. Yes, exactly. Exactly. That's that's what I'm I'm uh that's what that's what I'm writing about. Uh that uh that that it's not about being scared. It's not about scaring them, it's about giving them facts and what they can do. It's not I think I think we have to change our point of view on when we say disaster. Disaster is something that you can address. <laughs> I think for me, it's, it's something, you, you know, like it's a disaster if you're not doing anything. <laughs> like, like, um, like the concept of, uh, maybe we should talk about that, you know, like when, when we came, when our colleague, Kevin <laughs> wrote that natural disaster is, is, is not natural. It's actually true because if you think about it, uh, it's these are nat hazards uh, that uh, happen because we don't <laughs> we don't address it. So yeah, I, I mean yeah. that's absolutely it. And I think the the campaign to try and stop using the phrase natural disaster mm -hmm. on the premise that we make the choices or yeah. we make choices for other people to make them vulnerable yeah. really says it all that the disasters yeah. are our, our our choice in terms of how we allocate resources and you know where we force people to live or where people choose to live yeah. and so kevin blanchard who has 
really spearheaded this No Natural Disasters mm-hmm. campaign mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. drawing on 40, 50 years of science to yeah. try and say, don't use the term natural disaster. They are not natural. And this may be, as you're saying, actually, this may be the key to trying to convince people that we can make choices. Yeah. We should not create vulnerabilities for others or ourselves. Mm-hmm. And if we do want to ensure we have disaster safe societies and we focus on prevention, Mm -hmm. yeah, disasters are not natural. They're caused by us. So we can Mm -hmm. make the choices to try and avoid them. Yeah. So let's talk about that disaster by choice. (laughs) Disaster by choice. Why one, I'm very curious about the, the, the the title disaster by choice. And then you already touched upon that, that, that it's it's a choice we have we choose where we we live we choose where we uh, what to do and what not to do right so can you explain further your disaster by choice yeah, yeah. i mean the title <laughs> is brilliant and it's actually yeah. not mine so i wrote the manuscript and the publisher oxford university press sort of took the manuscript and said well we need a title because all books have titles and it was their brilliant marketing team <laughs> Yeah. which actually came up with that title. Yeah. To me, it really encapsulated this whole mm-hmm. point of disasters are not natural. And mm-hmm. so we sort of say, well, okay, so nature produces the earthquake or the flood or the hurricane. Yeah. We do have some influence because we know that when we engineer the river, we're changing the flood. We know that if we put a reservoir over a fault line, we're changing the earthquake. But that in itself is just a hazard. It's just sort of the environmental event event or environmental phenomenon what really causes a disaster is the fact that we cannot deal with it Mm -hmm. so we're too poor to make the choices or we don't have the knowledge or we simply don't care and it Mm -hmm. could mean that the people who have the power are saying well you have to live there but that's Mm -hmm. in a floodplain and they're not giving (laughs) you any options or any design approaches or any buildings Mm -hmm. which are resistant to flood or they're not telling you about warnings and evacuations Mm -hmm. This shows that disaster by choice is actually not really about the individual. Mm-hmm. We all have some resources, we all have some power, we all have some ability to make our selections, but some people have more than others. Mm-hmm. The unfortunate pattern is that those who have more, those who are in control, tend to be making the choice to create vulnerabilities for others. Yeah. And that is what we have to tackle. So we can talk about, oh, yes, vulnerability causes disasters, and here's how people are vulnerable in different ways. You're forced to live here, or you don't have a good livelihood, or people discriminate against you, so you have fewer choices. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, it's challenging those who create the structures and saying, yeah, vulnerability, it's about poverty. It's about wealth distribution and equity. It's about injustice. And to really treat people as human beings Mm -hmm. that's what is going to reduce vulnerability and stop disasters. Mm -hmm. So we have to make the choice to say, I'm not going to discriminate against someone because of their gender or sexuality or ethnicity or race. I'm going to treat them as a human being, Mm -hmm. accept them as a human being and saying that they actually deserve to have all the options which I have to try and avoid being vulnerable, to recognize a warning, to be to live out of the floodplain, to live in a seismically resistant property, to know when a tornado is coming or a tsunami, and being able to act and react. And then also, after I've survived, being able to go in and help the clean up, help others, try and get life uh, and livelihoods in the context of the post-hazard environment. And so our choice collectively really has to be to ensure that people do not make choices for others, which make them more vulnerable. I love that. That is perfect. I love that. It's 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 a. I I have been talking to a lot of my friends about this um, this pandemic, our topic of the century at this time. It's yeah. and and I can I always tell them that I'm so irked by a lot of people who are so insensitive about other people, especially those who are such as you, that you can stay at home having your coffee or or doing Monopoly or whatever, Instagramming. They don't have that privilege. And we should, those who have that privilege should be able to speak on their behalf. That's how I see your, 
how you should use your privilege. And yeah, um, and the pandemic and the response to it, sadly, yeah. illustrates this whole point of yeah. choices being made for others and the fact that the disaster is not natural. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we know microbes are around. I mean, that's not new, of course. Mm-hmm. What we needed is the appropriate surveillance and monitoring systems Mm -hmm. so that when a new dangerous microbe emerges, we latch onto it and we contain it. Mm -hmm. What was so awful is that the medical professionals were onto it right away. They knew this was big and this was bad. And then the authorities silenced them and intimidated them and Mm -hmm. basically let it get out of control. Mm -hmm. Then when countries knew it was serious and a fat lockdown might unfortunately mm-hmm. be an option. They were mm-hmm. far too slow in number one, trying to think, well, what is our strategy? And number yeah. two, if we are going to go into lockdown, how are we going to help the people who need it? Mm-hmm. So a country like New Zealand, which has the advantage of being an island, mm-hmm. went into lockdown early and quite hard. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of people suffered, but it also meant that they saved so many lives yeah. from the virus and were able to come out of lockdown mm-hmm much earlier. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, though, if our choice is to hurt people in lockdown, or to have them die of a disease, we've actually lost the battle already. I mean, that's no choice. We know that lockdown was essential, we know it was effective. But then why weren't we helping people in domestic violence situations? Why weren't we helping Mm -hmm. people who would self harm and commit suicide, who Mm -hmm. would use different substances? Mm -hmm. Why was the government, particularly in the UK, not prepared for the personal protective equipment that the health workers needed Mm -hmm. when we knew there was a pandemic two months before, or sorry, not the pandemic, we knew there was an epidemic and a major disease two months before the UK Mm -hmm. went into lockdown. And a pandemic particularly was high on the UK government's list of risks. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely appalling that more than 300 health and care workers in the UK have died of COVID-19, dozens of bus drivers and many other frontline workers, simply because they lack basic protective equipment. Mm -hmm. Again, if our choice is the doctor dies or the patient dies, that's no choice we've lost. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a disaster by choice. There's no, whatever happens, there's a disaster. And rather than thinking ahead, rather than having health systems which would function rather Mm -hmm. than knowing a pandemic could happen, which we did and Mm -hmm. taking 40, 50 years of experience to try and prepare. It was almost as if, Oh gee, there's a virus. Well, this is the first time it's happened. What are we going to do? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. What do we do? do? I mean, they stopped cancer diagnoses and cancer treatment in the UK rather than saying, well, hang on, if you plan, you can make some hospitals be for COVID-19 yeah, and some hospitals not for COVID nineteen. Mm-hmm. So we can protect our health professionals, yeah. and we can protect our population. Why do we set ourselves up so that the only mm-hmm. choice is a pandemic disaster or a lockdown yeah. disaster? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't it doesn't make sense. And if you have like, uh, like if I'll give an example in Korea, there I I just talked to Doctor Jung Won Soon, who's also who's also from UCL. Oh, okay. Yeah, you, ha- you have to meet him. He's really, yeah, he's all, he, yeah. this is uh, Dr. Jung Won Son, Son, yeah, Son, and he, he, we aired his um, coffee break earlier. Uh, we, I talked to him, and, and he, he talked about how Korea uh, faced the pandemic and how, why, they, why it was effective for them because the contact tracing they're high tech <laughs> and they're also, they're also, they were also testing, I think 200,000 per week or something, 200 or, or eight. it's really high. It's not, it's not normal. <laughs> it's not normal for uh, some other countries, but they, I think for me, overreacting to this pandemic, is much better than underreacting. <laughs> well, I don't <laughs> which, And, you know, I asked you earlier, yeah, I asked you earlier, were lessons learned from Haiyan? But South Korea yeah. did this because they had learned from SARS. Yeah, they learned from SARS. Medicine. They learned from SARS. They learned from H1N1. Mm-hmm. They, you know, it, uh, it was, uh, it, it, they, they, did con- they did contact tracing. And it's not even that, um, that 
difficult because I saw some of the videos and they they someone gets tested, they they just call the person in their cell phone. They track him. Where are you? Are you at home? <laughs> it's just that. <laughs> to, to me, to me, that's not an overreaction. I mean, that's what yeah. we need to be doing. And mm -hmm. this helps saves the lives yeah. of the bus drivers and the healthcare workers. Yeah. It helps save mm -hmm. the lives of people who may have lost the business mm -hmm. in which they put everything into and are yeah. now contemplating suicide. It saves lives oh, of yeah. the people caught in, caught in yeah. domestic, difficult yeah. domestic situations. Yeah. So yeah. testing 200,000 people a day, I mean, of course, this is disaster prevention. Yeah, yes, exactly. And also, if you look at other countries that have faced this pandemic as if it's a military operation, those are actually the countries that are facing really this pandemic in a disastrous way, I think. Because it's not, it's, you your soldiers in this pandemic are not the military. Your soldiers are your doctors. You give them proper equipment. You're, you give them proper support because a lot of the doctors are also contemplating suicide. I'm not kidding. There are a lot it, of doctors. Awesome. I've read some of yeah. like their, they, you, it's not normal for them. They, it, there was a documentary or a, a news um, article that I, read and and they have like a short video about the doctor and saying that the doctors were like it's we we face death every day every every month and we see we see people who are dying but not on this magnitude not on this magnitude that every day there's like three two people dying in front of you in the icu it's it's not natural and you're staying in the hospital 24 hours a day you don't see your family because you also want to protect them so you're staying in a dormitory in the hospital with and your it's coding. everyone working in the hospital the doctors the nurses the cleaning yes. staff the, the administrators cleaning staff, the security yeah. people and again it this is a disaster yes. when we put them in that situation mm -hmm. that they have to experience this that they have to decide between two people for a ventilator because there aren't yeah. enough uh, ventilators when the drugs which may be effective are not available mm -hmm. and they're sitting there with all their years of training experience just mm -hmm. not only watching people die but watching them die alone because yeah. the families can't even come in to mm -hmm. hold their hands That's and when we don't give them the mental health support they need mm -hmm. when we mm -hmm. do see doctors attempting and completing suicide and nurses yeah. and other staff Again, this is our disaster by choice. And yeah. when this is the only option, we've lost the game already. Yeah. So we need to be thinking long term and mm -hmm. say we've had pandemics before we knew this was coming. Mm -hmm. So why didn't we set up our societies yeah. and our health systems so that those are the front, front lines were ready and mm -hmm. so that people who did have to go into lockdown in difficult situations, mm -hmm. whether losing their business or whether being highly stressed by it, actually had the support which they need. Mm -hmm. So this, unfortunately, just yeah. shows that the whole context of disaster was not natural. It's not about mm -hmm. what nature is mm -hmm. doing to us. Yeah. It's about our long-term choices in terms of the governments we choose, how we mm -hmm. allocate resources. Oh, and yeah. Fact, we knew it was coming and didn't yeah. do what we had the yeah. knowledge yeah. that we knew what we had to do. I like that. I like that. It's, 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 it's our natural... It's our natural choice. <laughs> it's our choice. It's well, our and we choice. have to try and make it away, from, get it yeah. away from our yeah. natural choice. Yeah. The whole point is to have no disaster by choice. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, and, and I, I like, I like what you said about, um, about it. It's also about choosing the government that we, that we have right now, that's contributing to the disaster. Yeah, and it's scary in the UK that everyone looks to the Prime Minister and says, well, it's either his fault or he gets the credit. But, you know, there's a system there. And the system helps people like him get elected. Mm -hmm. People make their choice knowing exactly what he's like. And he went around shaking the hands of hospital patients with suspected coronavirus and then joked about it. Oh, God. So how do these systems get in place in the long term? Mm -hmm. which permit that sort of rise to power, 
which mean that people feel they actually want to vote for someone who has that attitude, or maybe there's no other viable choices within a certain election. Mm. So again, so much comes back to us. Yeah. And you know, it's easy to criticize a leader and it's easy to compliment yeah. the leader and all leaders deserve criticism. All leaders deserve yeah. compliments. But certainly in the UK, I'm very fortunate to be in a country where we do vote and we do mm-hmm. talk to the press and we can raise these issues. Mm-hmm. And why people do not want a leader who knows how to deal with the crisis, mm-hmm. that is a fundamental question because our choice who leads us mm-hmm. and yeah. it's our choice regarding the wider democratic systems and media mm-hmm. systems that are in place yeah. in terms of who can stand for office and who mm-hmm. ends up getting the most votes yeah see whether your mother or not or father or not it simply comes down to our choices of saying well who are Mm -hmm. we actually electing what media are we reading where are we getting our information Mm -hmm. and why do we end up with these systems and structures in place Mm -hmm. which basically give us no choice either die of the virus or have major problems in lockdown Mm -hmm. so this comes down to yes being our choice Mm -hmm. that even if you are poor you still read media And you Mm -hmm. should still vote, at least in the UK, not all countries Mm -hmm. can. Mm -hmm. And how are we going to hold our media, our leaders to account Mm -hmm. for not only the bad things, but also reward them for the good things which they did and recognize uh, the appropriate measures which were taken in many places Mm -hmm. in order to say, you know, that Prime Minister of New Zealand, yeah, she made some mistakes, as we all Mm -hmm. do. But look how well they did in Mm -hmm. terms of controlling lockdown and controlling Mm -hmm. the virus. So, yeah, so much comes down to us. And no matter how poor, no matter how marginalized, no matter how oppressed, there's always something which everyone can contribute. But absolutely, those of us with more choices, more resources, more power should be doing a lot more. And so in a sense, it's for me to hold myself to account and for you to hold Mm -hmm. me to account. Yeah, Because I can assure you I'll hold you to account (laughs) in terms of what you're doing. And you're right, it's about changing these attitudes and Mm -hmm. saying, well, where do they come from? And how can we get ourselves to accept that prevention is so much better than cure? Yeah. Cheaper financially, it saves lives, it helps the economy, it helps livelihoods. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And why do we so often go to saving money and saving the economy before we go to mm-hmm. saving lives and saving livelihoods? Yeah. It's those values. Mm-hmm. Those are all choices. Mm-hmm. So it's up to us to do the best within our constraints mm-hmm. to make these appropriate choices. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, we are, I think we're not going to end with this uh, this talk about the pandemic because it's it's it has so many layers of of problems. Um, it's not just the health. It's not just the it's not just the health. It's about the governance system. It's not. It's it's also about about um, domestic abuse that's you know there are so many layers of disasters that can happen within this pandemic and and what do you think that what do you think should we do to move forward um to address this and what do you think should one of course the government should do and what do you think should we as educators in the academy should do and and perhaps yeah, I mean, the, yeah the, the third would be what do you think should we as um because i'm a, a an urban planner um what, what do you think can can us in the design world can also do about this well i think you're doing it i mean it's wonderful learning about your phd work and you know your own attitude and how you're willing in, to help people and interested in helping people so a lot of this is saying universities have a role mm-hmm. academia has a role and you are fulfilling it so thank you so much mm-hmm. but we can't just sit in our own rooms we can't just sit in our towers which is why your initiative in doing these videos in talking to us and in teaching me a lot is so important mm-hmm. i hope that people watching this will then react you know i'm on twitter i'm on instagram mm-hmm. please connect with me tell me what i'm saying which is completely ridiculous tell me what doesn't <laughs> make sense or what I could, could I t- articulate better? Certainly, even in the book, you know, it's all very well to promote it as we're doing. And, you know, it's part of what <laughs> we're doing. But there are problems with the book. And there are a couple of factual errors. Mm-hmm. So it's about being able to call each other out respectfully. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Being able to do it in such a way that we improve. 
and recognizing the privilege from which we come from, yeah. which not everyone has. So how can we yeah. do things better? Mm-hmm. Specifically within my role and within your role too, absolutely, I do original science. Mm-hmm. And that's exciting. And we publish papers and we go to academic conferences. We're always seeing whether or not our science serves society. Mm-hmm. Because we want our knowledge to apply. We want our knowledge to be pragmatic. We want to ensure that people will take it up and use it constructively. And that's where we hold each other to account. Mm. But it's not just about, you know, sitting down and getting the data and doing the typing up. Mm. We do a lot of teaching. So we're standing in the classroom, Mm. working with our master's students, our PhD students, our undergrads to say, well, what do you need? And how can we do better? How can we actually send you out into the world much better prepared? Again, as I said earlier, with the skills, Mm. with the abilities. I mean, we can't, know everything it's just impossible and yeah we make knowledge mistakes fully understandable Mm. so how do we develop and promote the skills to be Mm self-critical to be constructively and respectfully criticizing and complimenting Mm -hmm. of other people Mm -hmm. so that we work together these fundamentally sort of your initial question into this was well what can we do but collectively as a society and it's about working together Mm -hmm. it's saying we're all different and that's wonderful we all come from diverse backgrounds and in diversity is strength. Mm-hmm. Yes. We do have issues, you know, with the people running our countries, with the people mm-hmm. controlling our media. How can we overcome that mm-hmm. in such a way that we keep people on side and mm-hmm. accept a variety of viewpoints, accept that people vote for different people as they mm-hmm. should, mm-hmm. accept that people read different media as they should, but still say we don't want anyone dying in a pandemic. We don't yeah. want anyone dying from lockdown. Mm-hmm. So what can we do to help out each other yeah. day to day and decade to decade with the ethos that prevention is better than cure? Yeah. So if it's as simple as wearing a face covering when I'm in a shop, mm-hmm. if it's as simple as washing my hands, of mm-hmm. course I'm going to do that. Mm-hmm. Because there are a small group of people yeah. who cannot wear a face mask. Yeah. There are far too many people who cannot even afford soap or hot water. Yeah. So we need to be yes. dealing with these fundamental mm-hmm. issues. We yeah. need to all be doing the small, simple things which we mm-hmm. can to yeah. simply be helping each other and mm-hmm. try to move forward where we have mm-hmm. neither a pandemic nor mm-hmm. lockdown, nor an earthquake disaster, yeah. nor a hurricane destroying an island, nor a tornado <laughs> ripping through a city. Mm-hmm. Because the tornado, the earthquake, the hurricane, the virus, those exist. That's not an issue. We can deal with those because we see so many people successfully dealing with it. Mm -hmm. It's those who don't have the choices to successfully deal with it that we need to work together to say, well, what are you lacking? Is it sexism? Is it racism? Mm -hmm. Is it the fact that you are forced to be poor? Is it that you don't have any choices? Is it the fact that you actually voted for a prime minister who doesn't wash his hands properly after being in a hospital environment? These are sort of all the questions to think about. And to say constructively, how can we work together? How can we move forward together so that none of us suffer, so that all of our vulnerabilities are reduced, and so that we do not have disasters by choice, but Mm -hmm. we are making the choices together to avoid disaster. Yeah. And I think I think that's a very good message to everyone that I to put it in a nutshell, I think compassion (laughs) should be. Part of our our individual psyches. I think we should That's all be compassionate. Word. We should all be compassionate. I think uh, I I don't think I have any other thing to add because that's that's basically it in a nutshell. Compassion. I think. Yeah, I, um, I agree. I mean, that's a wonderful word, and thank you for raising it. And I think I'll start yeah. taking that forward. Caring, compassion, recognizing yeah. recognizing each yeah. other as human beings. Yeah. And saying, of course, we're different and we should be. That Mm -hmm. should not stop compassion. That should not stop Mm -hmm. caring. Yeah. I I, I love it. I love this this coffee break because it somehow touches my heart. And it's, it's, um, I'm learning so much from you and, 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 and learning so much about the different layers of this disaster. And, um, Maybe for our parting message, uh, we're now going on our, you know, um, the last uh, part of our, our, our discussion. Um, what do you think can you impart to the young 
um, people out there who want to make a difference and or who also want to work on disaster? Well, it's fundamentally ensure that you do get yourself in a position which makes a difference. Mm -hmm. There's no particular formula. Mm -hmm. There is no single pathway, particularly now where the world really has been upended and it's not clear what jobs or career pathways will be available. Mm -hmm. Also, a lot of it is saying, well, what do you value? What are the options that you have? Because we all have constraints also. So within your own constraints, and what do you want within your career and your life beyond career? Mm. Then you need to come to me and tell me. Mm. Because I don't know. We're individuals. There's no one size fits all. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I can certainly help work through the different options and sort of say, well, this pathway is a bit difficult. This one is more open. And we do that with all our students. Again, we run the master's programs. We have the undergraduate in global humanitarian studies coming in in 2021 and our PhDs. And I just take direction from them. I say, look, I'm in a certain position. I've had a certain career pathway. I'm happy to talk about it. There are certain things I have not done, certain things I didn't want to do, but maybe you want different. And so what options are out there? What are realistic? And then once you've decided sort of where you're approximately going and what the possibilities are, what do you have to do to get there? Mm -hmm. And yeah, university education is a boom. So important and so helpful. And if you want to do development, if you want to try and stop disasters, if you want to be humanitarian, well, take a degree, which is about mm -hmm. development, disasters, humanitarianism. Yeah. Recognize the ups and downs, recognize the goods and bads, but always mm -hmm. keep that end goal in sight that we need to ensure our actions and our policies are based on evidence. Yeah. Science and research are one mm -hmm. input amongst many into that evidence. Mm -hmm. They also are shaped by values and help to shape mm -hmm. values, one of which is your wonderful word, word compassion. Mm -hmm. So we always need to keep in sight the fact that we're aiming to help society. Mm -hmm. It's education, science, research, compassion for mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. And by keeping this big picture, this fundamental ethos there, then we can work out the pragmatic pathways, which may be government, maybe international organizations, maybe the nonprofit sector, maybe the mm -hmm. for-profit sector. I mean, small and medium enterprises, owner-operated businesses, they are the community. They are the ones who give us the services, give us the products, and we have to involve them. So if you want to go and be an entrepreneur, be a private sector innovator, do it. Or maybe we can even convince more people to join you and me in academia yeah. to get that PhD yeah. and to become the researcher. But it's not the only pathway. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. I love it. I really have a dream job, but it is mm -hmm. not the only pathway. Yeah. So yeah, my advice, what do I impart to students coming to me? I say, no, what do you impart to me? What do you want? And then we can work out together yeah. how to reach that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ilan. You're so inspiring. No, and, thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, and I, I really think that we can, um, I'm, th I'm hoping that we can also work together in the future. Let um, me know. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I would be, I would love to, be able to work with you on something be good yeah. and how we can support you you know we're connected on social media yeah and I'd <laughs> we are. Anyone watching join me on social media and yes. yourself too and this is how we pull our ideas work yeah. together and simply learn teach and exchange yes. yes thank you so much and uh this is coffee break with urbana and ilan kalman and we'll see you soon guys bye Goodbye. thank you so